cloud. So hello everyone, welcome to the third webinar of the city uh, of the series resisting pushbacks. Um, today um, we meet again. Uh, you will be the privileged first uh, eyes of the public uh, listening in a new study that is being conducted by Nizar Ahmedasevic and Claudia Visa regarding the role of Austria uh, towards the fortress Europe and its practices. My name is Katerina Anastasiu, uh, and I work for Transform Europe. Transform is co-organizing this uh, series and supporting the study. Uh, so welcome. Um, I will not be your moderator today. I will be your silent moderator. If you have questions, technical difficulties, write something in the chat. We will be recording this session. And now I give over to Monica Mokre to introduce today's talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hello also from me. I'm very happy uh, to moderate this session today and to, to hear the first results of a study by two good friends and, and comrades. Um, and I will just briefly introduce them and then give them the floor. Uh, so uh, this study is conducted by Nijar Ahmedashevich and Claudia Wieser. Nijar is an independent researcher and journalist. She did her PhD on media assistance in post-conflict countries at the University of Graz uh, here in Austria. And her focus as a journalist is on media development in post-conflict countries, hate speech, human rights, feminism, and migrations. And Claudia Wiese is a social scientist based at the University of Vienna. She works on conflict, war, and colonialism in the Arab world with a special focus on the question of Palestine. She's a founding member of Pushback Alarm Austria and an activist at Doku Stelle Austria, a documentation and counseling center for people who, is, who experience Islamophobia and anti muslim racism. So, dear ones, um, I don't know who will take the floor first, but whoever it is, take it. <laughs> Thank you, Mas. Thank you, Monica. Um, I'll try to share my screen. Can you see that? Perfect. Okay, so thank you, Monica, again, and Kat for the generous introduction and for the possibility um, to conducting the study in this um, context um, of these webinar series. Um, we will be talking today about Austria's role in border externalization policies in the so-called Western Balkans. Um, again, we have been discussing this before. Uh, we use this term because it's also used or it makes sense to use it from the perspective of analyzing Europe because it's a term that is framed by Europe in and of itself. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, we decided to start uh, our input today by a recording that was sent to us yesterday by uh, a person called Ayub. Uh, Ayub got in contact with uh, us after he experienced a violent pushback by the Austrian authorities already in September 2020. Uh, it was a chain pushback through Slovenia, Croatia and back to Bosnia. Um, we wanted to invite him today to speak, but unfortunately his connection is not that good, so he sent us a sound recording, which we will start our presentation with. Um, we decided to do that because um, it's very important to have him with us today, because we're analyzing the structures that are trying to externalize his expertise and his presence today. So just try and see. So um, I ask him to basically uh, narrate or, or explain about what happened during the pushback. Uh, and Bosnia, we were civil friends. We decided to go on a trip from Bosnia to Austria, which took us 22 days to Austria. We bought all to city after that. We crossed the border to Croatia. We faced a difficulty with the police, but escaped to them. We spent 17 days in the forest of Croatia. Then we crossed it to the Slovenian border. We did not have any difficulty. And we spent in Slovenia two days later. We were one step away from the country of Austria. After we, we crossed it to the Austrian border, we walked 20 kilometers. We were close to the village of Sicheldorf. After that, we spotted someone in the woods. 
After that, he called it to police and they just it after use about two hours. Two hour. After we were called, we call it humanitarian, asylum, and all language. However, they did not pay any attention to use and the mock it use and told use that you had no right to anything and they began to speak and their mother tongue and took off our clothes and arrested us towards the police, the police station. We faced a lot of difficulty until we finally arrived in Austria. They were forced to deport us. We felt injustice and they broke our hearts. <laughs> After we were interrogated, our picture and personal information were taken and the Austrian police mystery told us she did not give us even a glass of water. With regard to three of my friends who took them to, to the shelter for minor, after my interview with the transla translator, she told me that you do not have to write to asylum knowing that I, I am a minor, but I did not tell them. After that, I was imprisoned for two days in the center and I room by myself. And then, to period, she took my fingerprint and took me back to Croatia. To Croatia and beat me and took me at two deportation people. I spent 24 hours after that. They drove me out to Bosnian border. I also received beating from two Croatian border guards. After that, I spent two months and Vilka Kladusha after which you, Ben and Orani Zara, and some friends stood with me. Ayub's and his group story are one of many examples of violent, brutal, and sometimes deadly effects of Europe's border externalization policies. Some of the group reached the destination, others, like Ayub, are still in limbo um, along the Balkan circuit. Since the so-called long summer of migration in 2015 and the closure of the Balkan route in 2016, people move in circuits, trying to make their way to the European Schengen area. Exactly one year after Ayub and his group of friends experienced the chain pushback from the Styrian border to Bosnia and Herzegovina, Austrian interior minister, back then Karl Nehammer, finished the last day of his trip to Kosovo, Albania and Montenegro, coordinating joint frameworks to fight what he calls illegal migration, terrorism, and organized crime. During the trip, he announced a return conference that would take place some months later in Vienna, bringing together high-ranking officials from more than 22 countries and representatives from different EU agencies. Main focus of this event was the question of how the Western Balkan states can be supported in effective deportation practices through the newly established joint coordination platform against so-called illegal migration based in Vienna. Bosnia and Herzegovina was mentioned as one of the main partners in such an endeavor. How such mechanism would materialize and on which legal grounds returns of people would take place is not known so far. Even for officials that we conducted and uh, discussed with during uh, our uh, investigation for the study, didn't know um, anything about it, any more details about it. Today's presentation gives first insights into a mapping that we have been conducting about Austrian-based actors, organizations, and multilateral corporations that were working um, with the support or that we are working on with the support of Trans from Europe. It is by far not an exhaustive overview, but an attempt to encourage a collective discussion and future investigation on, as we argue, Austria's leading role in border externalization policies, not only in the Western Balkans, but this specific paper looks at it. Thank you, uh, Claudia. Um, yeah, so uh, two of us uh, started this research with the idea um, to see the role of uh, Austria in everything that is happening and in relation to the mixed migrations in the um, so-called Western Balkan. But in order to see the role of uh, Austria, we decided um, uh, and we had to uh, look uh, much uh, 
to, to look into much bigger picture and to see uh, what uh, really the EU is uh, doing in the region, in, which, uh, in what way and uh, uh, what are the goals. Uh, so we went back um, in, in like by doing this research we, and looking um, in the past, uh, we kind of like uh, got a feeling that Austrian involvement, uh, but also uh, in general EU into issues related to um, security uh, in the region uh, is starting somewhere uh, from uh, 2001 or it intensified. Uh, from 2001 or after 9-11 uh, happened in, uh, in US. Back then, uh, most of uh, this was focused, most of these uh, meetings that were held and efforts uh, put by the EU in the Balkans uh, were uh, related to the issues uh, of terrorism. Uh, back then, people who lived in Bosnia can remember that uh, even uh, then, uh, some people uh, who were not Bosnian nationals, but uh, were living in Bosnia under different circumstances for, um, and had families for, uh, for a longer period of time, uh, were uh, took in prison and some of them were even denied uh, a right to stay in Bosnia. Uh, one case uh, especially uh, was, in, was interesting since um, that person was the first person to live, uh, live uh, to reside inside of the, until today, the only asylum center that we have in Bosnia, and that was built by the EU uh, in the mountains uh, close to Sarajevo. In that place, there is until today, uh, and even today, that place um, is hosting uh, asylum seekers. Uh, until today, the place does not uh, have um, internet connection. Uh, phone lines uh, are not available. Uh, there are no any kind of like a contact and people who are living there have to walk uh, for hours in order to reach a first gas station where they can uh, find uh, internet, use a phone and buy anything they need. Other than that, around them is only a forest. Uh, in uh, all these efforts, uh, European Union, then we started to go back uh, and to look in uh, what was happening even before 2015, uh, which is marked as a, as a year of migrations uh, in Europe. Uh, and uh, before we, uh, we, we, we did find the many meetings uh, that were held uh, among representatives of different EU countries, very often Austria was the leader or Austria was an organizer or Austria was the country where uh, the meetings were happening. Uh, but along uh, Austria, uh, very often these meetings were present uh, representatives uh, from countries uh, like uh, Slovakia, uh, Hungary, uh, Slovenia, and uh, other countries with, that are surrounding, if I can uh, use that word, uh, so-called Western Balkans. Um, however, uh, the, the, the efforts to work on the policies uh, related to migrations in the area of the Balkans uh, from the side of Western uh, of the EU um, are uh, also, we can trace them back uh, to the moment uh, when uh, the, the, the region uh, received the message from the EU um, that all of the countries are or could uh, become uh, member states uh, one day. Until today, only Croatia uh, managed to achieve uh, this goal. Uh, all the other countries are in the different uh, stages uh, of ne uh, negotiations and adjustment uh, to the rules and requirements uh, by the EU. But these requirements are often changing. Uh, so since uh, 2014, these requirements are more and more related to migrations. Uh, uh, with these, uh, when I say related to migrations, uh, even before uh, some of the requirements were related to the same issue, but uh, more uh, toward the issue related to migrations from the Western Balkans, because as you know, Balkans is until today remains um, also a source of migrations. Just in the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, over the last uh, year, um, actually since since pandemic started, so it's two years already, um, more than 180,000 people left, uh, which is three times more 
than the number of people uh, on the move who crossed uh, through Bosnia and Herzegovina, transited through Bosnia and Herzegovina and continued uh, in, in attempt actually to enter um, EU. In all these uh, attempts, we also uh, discovered, and uh, Claudia will tell you more about uh, several initiatives uh, that, that were started, uh, initiated uh, in Austria. Uh, but um, I kind of like want to focus on the on, on, on present moment and the role of uh, Austria. Uh, that uh, at the beginning together, uh, when I said the beginning, I referred to uh, 2018 uh, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, when the flow of uh, people on the move increased uh, in the country. Uh, since uh, as well as many other countries in the region, especially Bosnia, Kosovo, but also uh, all the other countries uh, are considered by EU as a weak states uh, ruled by corruption uh, and the political elites uh, that are not really uh, ready to, uh, to accept the change. But however, Bosnia and Kosovo are uh, until today uh, seen as a special cases and both countries uh, remain semi-protectorate. Uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina arrival uh, or increase uh, in the numbers of um, people on the move who are uh, transiting uh, through the country started at the end of 2017 and continued uh, in 2018. And due to this attitude uh, from the EU that Bosnia is a weak state uh, where there is no rule of law, um, the EU made the decision without consulting um, people in Bosnia are never consulted. So it's even for me absurd even to mention that, but yeah, without consulting or even announcing it in some uh, uh, democratic way uh, that the EU will actually uh, take um, over from the state. And they, uh, the EU decided, decided that um, they will be in a way represented uh, by international organizations for migration. Uh, uh, or represented, or actually, this organization, like many other many other countries around the world, is a manager of the donations. But in Bosnia and Herzegovina, this organization is um, in charge uh, also for setting the rules and the path uh, of um, the policies that are developed in relations to uh, mixed migration. Uh, what uh, we, uh, two of us, noticed, but also what many other researchers noticed in these um, couple of uh, years, um, is that uh, the focus uh, all this time remains on more security and on uh, keeping uh, the borders closed. In the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina, not that much effort is put into keeping the borders, uh, borders of Bay uh, closed from Serbia or Montenegro, uh, but a huge effort is placed on uh, keeping the uh, Croatian border, which is the first AU country after Bosnia, uh, sealed. And that's why uh, so many pushbacks. In the same way, uh, Serbia pre performs a kind of like a duty of um, border guard uh, for uh, their uh, countries that are neighboring uh, the, uh, Serbia and that are part uh, of the EU. Uh, but what is specific in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, we encountered uh, many uh, people on the move who told us that that is the only country where local police, uh, when they uh, approach EU border, is uh, forbidding them uh, to, uh, to continue. Usually they are pushed back only by the police or border police or Frontex of the country where they are trying to enter. However, in Bosnia, local police is also um, trying uh, to prevent people from uh, coming close to the EU border. Uh, back at the 2018, um, and that is decision that was never published and made public uh, officially, uh, but what some of the media uh, were reporting about is that EU uh, issued the order or um, in charge uh, uh, IOM to make sure that none of the um, accommodation centers, let's call it uh, like that for this uh, purpose, uh, will be uh, in a close proximity to EU border. Uh, nevertheless, uh, due to uh, increased number of people in that area, uh, many makeshift camps uh, were created in 
very close uh, to the border. And, um, and also then later IOM had to respond and in order to uh, kind of like try to control uh, this movement of people, they started um, renting the private property, property and establishing uh, more uh, temporary accommodation centers uh, as they are called. Um, in, in, at the beginning, the EU was the main donor uh, of, uh, for the IOM. Uh, however, what we noticed uh, that is happening and that started sometimes in the, with the pandemic is that uh, more and more individual countries, including Austria, actually Austria is somehow becoming leader in this, um, are uh, donating individually and focusing on, or, or, or on different uh, aspects of this migration management, um, as, they, as they call it. Um, in the, this case, this 1 million uh, euro that is mentioned uh, in this uh, slide uh, went for the establishment uh, of the uh, new uh, temporary accommodation center, which will not be temporary, but the name is still there, um, that is LIPA, and uh, which is placed uh, close to the city of Bihać. When I say close, it's not um, really true because it's a 25 kilometers away from Bihać, high up in the mountains, in the very windy uh, area. And this wind is really strong. And one of the reasons why even uh, before, uh, not many uh, people lived in this uh, area. Uh, according to the census that we have from uh, the times of before the war, uh, which is kind of like more relevant than what it, what it happened uh, later. Uh, only 47 families lived in the area of Lipa. Uh, and the main reason is uh, because that area was never uh, really place uh, livable or that people uh, could really um, spend a life there. Uh, not only this very strong wind, uh, but also it's a deep uh, in the forest. Uh, the road was built only recently and only for the purpose of Lipa, even though even until today, six kilometers of the road that is leading toward this um, new camp. And we have some slides uh, showing uh, this new camp. It's a huge, as you can see. At the beginning, um, in 2020, uh, this was a um, tent camp. Uh, and then this tent camp uh, was burned down in uh, December uh, of uh, 2020. And uh, more than 1,000 people were left without any shelter in the cold uh, winter uh, in the mountains uh, near Bihać. Uh, before, on the same day, um, actually, uh, when, when the, the fire happened, IOM and all other organizations left the place uh, because in the months before, they were insisting that the Bosnian government should take more responsibility. And they're still insisting on this shift of responsibility, which is kind of like very strange and very hard to understand. And it is happening all over the region that EU is insisting uh, that the locals are taking over but everything what local governments are doing, AU observe, and they, uh, uh, they put their, um, their comments uh, and inside of the yearly uh, progress report uh, for each of the countries and progress reports are made so to follow the progress of each of the countries on their way uh, toward the EU. Uh, so requirement for the Bosnian government uh, from the EU was to take over uh, the camp. Bosnian government, of course, was uh, reluctant to do that. Um, and uh, on the night in December, uh, when the IOM left, uh, the camp uh, was burned down. Uh, so when the fire uh, happened, uh, and in weeks after that, uh, there was nobody to uh, provide help uh, to people. It was snow. It was extremely cold. Uh, so some people tried to reach uh, the city and to find a shelter. Nevertheless, local police uh, stopped them uh, from doing that and pushing them all back into the burn camp of, of uh, Lipa. For a couple of days, food was not provided. Uh, then uh, red local Red Cross uh, came. And at that moment, um, SOS Balkan route, which Claudia will talk uh, later on more, uh, 
uh, provided really significant help because they were the, the first big organization with significant um, donations to come uh, and to help to Red Cross uh, to provide at least one meal uh, for all the people uh, who were there. Uh, nevertheless, soon uh, under the huge pressure, Bosnian government uh, made the decision uh, that the, um, this area will uh, can be turned into the official camp and the EU promised uh, money and Austria uh, took a lead uh, in um, these donations and uh, in uh, everything that is happening until uh, now um, in that area together with Italy, uh, Vatican and several, several other uh, big, uh, big country. Um, in uh, November, uh, October uh, last year, after a very long time, finally Lipa was uh, open. Now it's, um, it is a container uh, camp. All the containers are donations from Austria. Um, there are more than 300 containers. Each container can accommodate six people. Uh, and the idea, the plan is that uh, this uh, camp will accommodate um, single men who are traveling, um, families and unaccompanied minor. Uh, I spoke with some of the people who are working um, in this camp. Officially, uh, these people are working uh, for uh, the state uh, ministry of security that is in charge uh, for uh, asylum uh, issues in Bosnia. However, what I discovered is that um, actually this, uh, all the employees uh, except one, uh, but all the others are uh, interviewed. Uh, they responded uh, on the job call uh, on the IOM website. Uh, were interviewed uh, by IOM personnel, including foreigners, uh, and are paid uh, from the EU. Uh, so I'm, I'm not really sure we can really consider them uh, as uh, employees uh, of the state of Bosnia uh, and Herzegovina. Most certainly, they don't consider themselves as a, as a state of employees. Um, the area uh, is still, even though now uh, with all these donations uh, that are pouring uh, in, um, uh, there is electricity, but not uh, all the time. Uh, there is a water, which is still uh, not really running water and not all uh, warm water all the time. Uh, there are three meals uh, a day. Um, and now there is uh, some kind of medical uh, help and some kind of um, legal assistance uh, for uh, all these people uh, who are placed there. Nevertheless, it's still uh, very far away. It's far away from the border. It's far away for people who want to leave the camp and they need uh, to walk more than 10 hours uh, to reach the place where from they can start um, their new attempt uh, or game, as they call it, uh, to cross. Uh, to cross the border. There is no infrastructure around this place. Uh, there are a couple of improvised um, small shops uh, where people can uh, buy um, basic things, uh, which are uh, three times uh, more expensive than um, anywhere in the city of Bihać uh, or uh, Velika Kladusha. Uh, it is uh, strictly controlled. Uh, as you can see, even in this picture, uh, there are uh, wires uh, around the camp. All the people who are entering camp, uh, this one, uh, as well as all other camps that are controlled uh, by uh, IOM together with the state uh, ministry, uh, um, EU donated uh, equipment uh, for registration and identification of people. Uh, these uh, data that are collected uh, in this way, uh, even though all the people have to leave all 10, 10, 10 fingerprints, the uh, picture, uh, and the data, it's not really certain um, who has the access to these data. 100% uh, or more certainly uh, it is uh, IOM, uh, as well uh, as um, EU uh, Special Representative Office in Bosnia. In the meantime, and that's well, uh, also a very important moment, um, also during the pandemic, uh, EU appointed a special uh, representative uh, uh, who is working inside uh, of the Ministry of Security. Uh, he is also Austrian. Soon his mandate uh, will uh, expire, but I guess a new person will come. It's the first time ever that EU done this. Uh, he is um, practically making decisions uh, that are implemented by the Ministry uh, of uh, Security. 
and he do have access um, to uh, different informations possessed by the ministry, state ministry, um, in possession of state ministry um, of security. And um, in one of the interviews he gave to one other researcher, we, we could not, uh, we, we didn't have a chance to speak with him for the purpose of this research. Um, uh, he said that one of the advices given uh, to the Bosnian government uh, when the pandemic started was to use uh, this opportunity and to do everything they can uh, to increase uh, security and uh, to find a way how to control uh, migrant uh, movements. And um, recently, I am, um, huh, I have to use the word celebrated, uh, Claudia, if you can uh, show us, uh, yeah, celebrated uh, 100 days of Lipa. This is the cake uh, they made. Um, and uh, also the celebration was paid uh, from the same funding uh, that, uh, that everything else uh, in Bosnia. Uh, so I guess also from Austria and uh, pieces of cake uh, were given um, to the people uh, who are forced to uh, stay there, who are until today um, on a regular basis uh, picked up uh, by um, the police and against their will um, taken uh, to this uh, place where they are behind the wires. And one of the employees I spoke with uh, told me that uh, bears are often coming down to the camp as well as uh, other uh, wild animals. But what is uh, most worrying, and um, one of the next slides um, is showing what is uh, actually um, happening at the same time, is that uh, this cooperation and the meetings between uh, not only Bosnian, uh, but also um, other um, relevant institution in the region uh, with the Austrian uh, Ministry of Interior, as well as with some other countries. And in these uh, meetings, uh, very often the topic uh, is uh, focused on how uh, to uh, start and what to do uh, in order uh, to enable uh, Western Balkans uh, state um, to uh, deport people uh, from their territory to the countries of origin. Uh, in the case of Bosnia, uh, honestly, I don't know for other countries, but I believe that it's also part uh, of these EU accession talks. In the case of Bosnia, we have agreement with EU according to which the EU can send uh, back to Bosnia, not only citizens of Bosnia, if they uh, breach um, the three visa regime, we have a three visa regime, but we cannot stay longer than three months uh, in, um, in, e in Schengen zone. But according to this agreement, they can send any uh, person uh, who uh, was at the territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, at any given time. Uh, and uh, from some of the uh, statements by the Austrian uh, officials, who are uh, visiting frequently Bosnia and Herzegovina and the rest of the region, uh, we could um, see that the plans are being made uh, that Lipa uh, could uh, become uh, one of the centers in the region where from people will be uh, deported uh, very soon. Uh, the same uh, process and the same negotiations are uh, happening uh, in, other, in other parts um, of, the, of the region. Uh, and uh, Claudia, I will, I will give you Thank you. Um, we'll go uh, a step back um, because what we have been doing also in the study uh, is not only what Nijara has been pointing out now to really see and analyze the different meetings by the Austrian officials, by the Austrian representatives that are now based at EU level or looking at different other organizations, but we wanted to understand how these corporations, these bilateral agreements, right, these meetings, how could this be uh, established? How has this developed for such a long time? And um, one of the mechanisms that is used, or one of the forums that is used, um, is the so-called Salzburg Forum. This is a name that comes up all over the place when you start to read different documents, when you start to analyze, like, you know, and search for different agreements that are written down, minutes that are taken. Uh, and I just want to talk, like, I don't know, talk to you about the history of the Salzburg Forum now. This is the official website, and uh, I'm sorry for uh, the very bad quality. It reminds 
uh, people who frequently look at the uh, web page of the Austrian Ministry of Interior about their design. So it's, you also see that it's designed and, and hosted by the Austrians in and of itself. Um, so let's go back in time uh, and look at the history of the Salzburg Forum. Uh, in August 2001, uh, Austrian Interior Minister Ernst Strasser, back then um, a member of the Austrian People's Party, invited his colleagues from Slovakia, Slovenia, Czech Republic, Hungary and Poland uh, to one of the country's most prestigious, prestigious tourist destinations in Salzburg to initiate a so-called Central European Security Partnership called Salzburg Forum. Back then, only Austria was a full member of the European Union, and the multilateral cooperation, the Salzburg Forum, should serve the preparation for the other countries for EU accession. However, in the years ahead, the Salzburg Forum provided a space for, and I quote here, regional police cooperation as well as regional cooperation on border control, fighting the trafficking of people and asylum, as well as the exchange of opinions on particular EU matters. The informal group meetings between these different member states that took place twice a year developed into different working groups and sub-working groups, for example, the Central European Operational Network, which enabled the members to build common policy center, poli police centers, joint patrols in border areas, and the exchange of liaison officers and people who have been working on pushbacks uh, in different border regions that have been thinking about how is it that the police can cooperate so um, you know, electantly about different uh, pushbacks? Um, you, you have to come back to the Salzburg Forum and look at these different bilateral agreements. In the context of this cooperation, um, the partners also moved from only exchanging information to testing, evaluating, and implementing security strategies and institutionalized bilateral corporations that should function also as a role model for other European member states. Um, Bulgaria and Romania joined the Salzburg Forum in 2006 and strengthened the lobbying possibilities for shared security interests of the forum within the European Union. Meetings and conferences of the forum are regularly joined by EU representatives and agencies such as Frontex, Europol, and ICMPD, the International Center for Migration and Policy Development. And they serve as kind of like an unbureaucratic space to meet and directly discuss EU policies that are then pushed formally um, uh, during different meetings uh, in the Justice and Home Affairs Council on the level of the EU. So it really serves as a space where you first, uh, you know, meet, you unbureaucratically decide which kind of policies you want to push, and then you vote for that collectively. And this is not the only cooperation, of course, uh, or forum uh, of different, you know, member states that, 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 are, that are happening, but it's one of the most strongest when we look um, at the question of so-called border externalizations. And um, just to give you, um, so these are like basically how these conferences look like in very prestigious uh, locations in, in different member states of the forum. Um, here you see uh, former Interior Minister uh, Nihama and Seehofer, the Interior Minister of Germany until 2021, I think. Yes. Um, going back in time, um, we remember uh, here's Austria Interior Minister Fechter. Uh, in a press release following the 10 years anniversary of the Salzburg Forum in 2010, Austrian Interior Minister Maria Fechter highlighted the growing strengths of the multilateral security cooperation with the EU, reminding Brussels about their number of votes within the Justice and Home Affairs Council and the forum's determination to stop mass migration and crime crossing the border. Apart from regular providing the group um, for a platform for the xenophobic and racist media narratives um, during the press conferences following the different meetings, um, access to internal documents or agreements uh, is, is very, very difficult. And uh, in the context of the study, we also have been trying to speak to Austrian um, parliamentary representatives and get their insights on the Salzburg Forum and on their policies and internal documents, but uh, also for them, like we have been talking to um, Steffi Crispa from the NEOS, and uh, also for them, it's very difficult to access anything related to the Salzburg Forum. 
It's also the Salzburg Forum is also stated prominently in Austria's internal security strategy already in 2012 and 13, with highlighting um, the goals for foreign policy uh, strategies where the Western Balkans are one key priority next to um, intensifying contacts and networks with, for example, the USA and Russia. So it's also very important to see that Austria has been focusing on this region um, also within the national security plans. And then they have been you know, bringing these discussions also to these forums that then has been pushing for different policies. Um, what is important is also to mention, and here we'll go back a bit to this. Um, you see that already in 2007, so-called a group of friends was invited to join the Salzburg Forum. Uh, while Croatia joined as an observer, um, so-called friends were invited, and these included Albania, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Macedonia, Serbia, and Montenegro. Uh, so the group of friends was like the Western Balkan group of friends, as they will be later be called in different minutes and documents. Um, and uh, within the forum, the group of friends, of course, engaged in cooperation and dialogue, and uh, in return was offered support of what the uh, forum originally was supposed to do uh, uh, to support EU accession of different member states. So Nijara has already been speaking about that at the beginning, um, you know, to bringing uh, these states in a position where they want to uh, become members of the European Union. And uh, for that, um, you have to basically apply to all of the regulations that are in force. Um, okay, um, just checking the time. Um, we have been speaking uh, in the introduction about a very important tool of the Salzburg Forum or a tool that developed out of the Salzburg Forum quite recently. And this is the joint coordination platform uh, uh, to fight illegal migration, as they call it. Um, many who are here as well have been trying to find out more information about that. And uh, we have been trying to describe it for us also within the study, uh, which has not been easy because also we have not been able to access more information about it. But in general, what, what we think it does is um, that this coordination platform, which is based in Vienna since 2021, um, functions uh, as a network or a tool that allows for political and strategic action outside Schengen area, monitoring and controlling the EU's external borders in and as well as action in third countries. So um, the office of this joint coordination platform uh, based in Vienna is led by Bernd Kölner, who is a former Frontex vice president. And as far as we know by now, um, this coordination platform will basically function as a hinge for Frontex. Um, we will discuss this later also in the discussion. At the moment, uh, the Frontex agency uh, is not allowed to report uh, organized deportations on behalf of third uh, countries, so to say. And um, the idea is that this coordination platform basically um, functions as an in-between between Frontex organizing uh, deportations within the European Union and then to Bosnia or other states. And then from there, the joint coordination platform will take over and basically uh, advise uh, local countries to further uh, work on their deportation skills. Um, and here, um, just another important factor that we couldn't really um, for, uh, like spend much time about looking at, but I've been uh, mentioning before the International Center for Migration and Policy Development, ICMPD, which is also based in Austria and led by uh, vice or ex-vice chancellor of Austria, Michael Spindelecker, um, there's one investigative journalist that has been pointing to this specific institution as being um, the organization that will host different policies of the joint coordination platform locally, which means um, currently um, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And um, I've been trying to go through the many, many documents of different projects ICMPT is implementing, and it's really, really difficult because there's so many of them. But um, I, I think I have been able to locate um, one of the projects that basically hint to this function. Um, if you see here, it's a project called uh, Enhancement of Migration Information System for Strengthening Migration Asylum and Border Management. And um, if you look at the goals, um, you have here uh, upgrading and extending the migration information system with additional online application, 
then here introducing the system of electronic biometric residence permits, which means that people on the move will be registered and the biometric data will be taken from them, right? Like these are all uh, functions and systems that prepare for uh, deportations uh, to happen to take place. And so like, we think or or we we in our study we hint to icmpd in basically locally running these projects and i think one last sentence i want to say about it is that if you try to find an actor you always just hear capacity building training development on all different levels then you never know who is actually doing what in the end right so it's always like on this eu level or international level or institutional level it's always like we train we build capacity we inform we advise and then who is actually um you know doing the crime in and of self which would be a deportation and then i mean of course it would be a local police personnel in that sense and we have already been seeing the first trainings between austrian police and bosnian uh, police officers taking place in vienna last year where they were specifically trained on deportations so they were basically taking part in deportation flights one to nigeria and one uh, from uh, austria to bosnia Yes, so this is the network uh, and the so-called uh, um, coordination platform that we will be specifically describing also in the paper and uh, go into much more details. And um, I will continue with the so-called uh, last institution that we want to discuss today, or organization, um, and this is Hilfswerk uh, International. Why we have been trying to start looking at Hilfswerk International, and here we have the 1 million that Nizal has been speaking about before, that was donated by the Austrian Development Agency through IOM to Lipa. But then we also found another around half a million uh, that was donated by uh, the government of Upper Austria um, to uh, an organization or to the Camp Lipa, and it was implemented through Hilfswerk. So we were like, ah, okay, what is Hilfswerk doing? And um, I mean, people who are familiar with the work in Hilfswerk in Austria uh, know that it's, you know, it's, it's known for basically working in social services, mobile healthcare with elderly people. This is what we know from Hilfswerk in Austria. Hilfswerk International, if you look at the profile, it's also a very common international humanitarian aid organization that has different projects around the globe, right? Um, and um, we have been able uh, to speak to or to conduct two interviews, once with the um, director in chief, Stefan Fritz, and also with the local coordinator of the regional office in Bosnia Herzegovina. And through these interviews, we have been, you know, able to get more insights in the work of Skillswerk International. And um, I want just to point here, here you see the different projects um, that are implemented in Bosnia and Herzegovina and also in the region. And um, we have been asking uh, in our interviews why suddenly you see that here, I mean, here it's like improvising living conditions for migrants in Rihaj. This is the donation that came to Lipa Camp. And here you have uh, a project that is basically um, working or supporting um, migration management. So through our interviews, we have been finding out that this is actually, you know, one of the main shifts that the organization is also going through on a local level from reconstruction, and it has been based in the country for many, many years, to now shifting their priorities also to this question of uh, migration management and having very close relations and corporations and projects, uh, specifically with the Ministry of Security. Uh, and they have very, very close contact with the um, joint coordination platform. Um, they speak with Kerner like about bands, their friends, right, coming and visiting them. So you really see that they are extremely close uh, to this question of securitization and uh, what they are specifically doing or what we have been discussing with them in our interviews were that they organize um, different meetings. So their official narrative was like, we are good listeners, we have to bring people together, nothing is working because uh, IOM is just implementing from above and we are an alternative to all of that. So we, we provide spaces, to come together like conferences. And here you see one of the uh, Sarajevo migration dialogues brought together a number of regional and European officials. So here you have, um, you know, whoever is engaged in the question of uh, border exilization basically is coming together in these dialogues. 
And um, I think with what I want to stop here, and maybe Nijal, you want to add something, um, what was really striking in the interviews uh, with officials of Hirsuk International was that we have been asking them about the future, right? So you are engaged now in securitization of, of this border regime. So what will happen in the next five years? And um, you know, there was not much reaction. And one of it was that uh, Hirsuk International is not engaged in politics. Um, Another answer was that Camp Lipa might be a nice amusement park or a center for locals in the years to come. And so we really felt that, that there is like a distance and something that they don't want to speak about because they know exactly um, where they are involved in. Um, Nijala, you want to add something to here? Just a small thing. And, 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 and we can maybe end and um, open some questions that also for two of us are like really important and big question and that is that most of these me meetings that are uh, organized and the decisions that are that are made uh, in relations to mixed migrations in the in the Balkans um, are uh, kind of like almost secret. So public usually know that these meetings are happening, uh, that something is happening, public will be informed about the, the final result to some level uh, but most of the things uh, are uh, far away uh, from the public uh, no media are uh, allowed like this this big meeting that was uh, held in Sarajevo in October last year as I remember yeah so the meeting was uh, after the meeting Lipa was inaugurated and the people from the the European Commission even came in Bosnia for that uh, but uh, only the opening session and the opening remarks uh, were uh, public everything else uh, that happened in this meeting uh, until today uh, not Bosnian not European public uh, really knows we tried and we asked some of the people we interviewed uh, and who were involved in this um, organization we also tried to some journalists uh, to get uh, documents about what did happen there or any document uh, about this and uh, practically nothing but uh, the agenda uh, was available to us and these uh, introductory remarks in the same way many of um, other meetings uh, are done especially as Claudia uh, spoke about what is happening with the um, Salzburg uh, forum yeah and maybe just to add to that that um, we have the feeling that the history international is really trying to i mean this is also what they openly have been saying that you know we are better we can do better there is much need for our projects and our expertise so this is this is where we want to direct our focus right and i, I think uh, also one 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 quote maybe before the end was like that uh, actually we want to work in humanitarian issues also with migrants and refugees but iom is taking all of these areas right so their beneficiaries at the moment is basically the, the Ministry of Security. Um, and this is a huge shift if you speak of a humanitarian aid organization like Hirsuk International. So um, this, these are really different um, you know, directions we, we want to look at and also want to basically open the discussion at um, would you if I may just add one more thing, we have, um, and, and now I'm talking as somebody who is living in Bosnia and what I can see uh, from, from a Sarajevo angle is that uh, many uh, members of the European Parliament from Austria and politicians from Austria uh, are coming to Bosnia, uh, visiting the places where uh, migrants are gathering, meeting with the uh, officials at different levels uh, in Bosnia. Um, uh, we don't know uh, what are the results uh, of these meetings and how uh, this is used in, in, in Austria, if it is uh, used uh, for any, any purposes. Um, at the same time, very important player uh, when it comes to civil society uh, became um, SOS uh, Balkan Root uh, that has um, in a way that also uh, people from Bosnia cannot uh, explain, uh, but uh, they do have access uh, to places uh, that none of the Bosnian uh, representative of the civil society, including the media, do not have. Uh, so we see a representative of uh, representatives coming uh, from Austria uh, with SOS Balkan route, uh, meeting with the local politicians, which is impossible uh, for us uh, in Bosnia or entering the places uh, that are 
almost uh, forbidden uh, for local uh, civil society and um, they are also handling as well as as these organizations other that we uh, mentioned uh, huge donations and in the, they are distributing these donations among um, partners uh, civil society partners who um, they choose uh, who are uh, who are they and uh, the, what they want uh, to do but it's also one 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 significant player coming uh, from Austria. Thank you. Then maybe, uh, Claudia, you stop sharing. Um, we can add yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Um, do you uh, want to, to still read them or? Um... Um, yeah, I mean, we, we can bring them up and then maybe I stop screen sharing so we can see all different uh, other participants. I mean, uh, okay, so the, the one question was again, I mean, we started with, with the youth, right? And, and I think still, uh, although we are pointing to, to, to future scenarios, uh, pushbacks at the moment are still like one of the most, you know, wireless practices that, 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 I, that I'm placed on these different borders. And so, um, okay, one question was that, you know, how can we, how important are transnational networks specifically in resisting these border regimes? And here we specifically wanted to discuss the question of how to resist pushbacks and, um, I mean, we can be, talk a bit more about pushback alarm Austria here and, and what are we doing in trying to support people who experience pushbacks and what are maybe other experiences of people in the audience. Um, then uh, we are still not sure <laughs> why, uh, you know, going through all these documents and trying to put pieces together, why Austria has actually been taken up or was given such a prominent role in border exterioration policy, specifically in the Western Balkans. So of course the paper should like try to answer that, but we still want to ask the audience if you know if you after hearing us now have some inputs on that. Um, and then again, uh, what, what Nijara also just brought up is the Austrian public aware of the leading role Austria has in the region of the money that is spent, of the different you know uh, people that are coming to visit, what's going on, which which meetings are taking place in Vienna, for example. Um, and then does Austria has a similar role in other countries in the region, um, specifically focusing on Serbia? Um, you know, there have been narratives around some years ago that Serbia might also serve as a place for returning uh, people who have negative asylum decisions from Austria. Was this just brought up by the right-wing politicians as a narrative, or is there something, uh, you know, materializing on these grounds as well? And um, yeah, what does the future bring? Uh, we don't think that Lipa will become a local amusement park. Uh, uh, on contrary, um, what will this uh, um, center serve in the future to come? Um, yeah, these, these are our very open questions. We are also happy for others. Um, I'll stop sharing the screen. Okay, thank you. First of all, I think this was very, very dense and a lot of, of, of uh, information